So today we are delighted to welcome Kate Nash um, for an interview. Um, so just to tell you how it's going to go, the interview will be about 30 to 40 minutes, after which we'll have time for questions. And then we should be completely done by about 2.30. Um, so welcome, Kate. Kate Nash, OBE, is the chief executive and founder of Purple Space, the world's only professional development hub for disability employee resource groups and networks. Kate describes herself as the storyteller, the impatient activist, the patient strategist, the business leader and the critical friend. Purple Space was founded after the publication of Kate's first book, Secrets and Big News, in 2015. Her most recent book, Positively Purple, published in 2022, is a practical guide via a real story about Kate's life to help drive purposeful change for and by people with disabilities. And today I have the pleasure of interviewing Kate about her book and the vision of disability equality advocacy she lays out in it. So Kate, in Positively Purple, you begin by narrating your personal experience with disability and how it affected your teen years and also your educational and employment prospects. Reflecting on this, how did you move from disability as a personal experience to an understanding of it as a social and political issue? What were the key stages of that journey and how important is it to emphasise that disability is political? Oh, well, look, Kavita, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation to, to join you. I'm very much looking forward to our discussion and uh, we can follow our nose. Look, this is a great opening question. So let me offer some thoughts. Um, so for those of you who have met me, who know that I share extensively about my own personal and political story of disability. But um, for, for, for clarity, I have arthritis. I have had it for many, many years. And to your question, I suppose, it was me feeling quite crushed by the weight of other people's perceptions uh, about my potential in life. So for me, I acquired juvenile chronic arthritis or Stills disease, a type of rheumatoid arthritis at the age of 15. And I went from running around the hockey pitch, not that I was ever good at hockey, um, to being very limited in my physicality. And as a youngster, I didn't know about the politics of disablement. I didn't feel that my human experience was something that was a political experience. It was, you know, it was simply I felt like a youngster having a disease that potentially I was too young to have. So but to your question, so I felt crushed by that. And it was really my journey, which was about entering the world of politics, albeit I didn't feel it was a political move, but I responded to an advert in a, an NGO, a for purpose organisation called Scope here in the UK. And I knew I wanted to make a difference. You know, I'd spotted how other people had perceived and met and received me differently. And that just felt wrong, really. I felt that there was something missing there. So the stages, I suppose, for me, it was about getting involved. So my work journey was characterised by me wanting to make a difference in the world and to wanting to be helpful and useful in driving wholesale cultural change so that individuals felt differently about the beauty and the opportunity of working with and uh, making space and places for people with disabilities, as well as, of course, serving our needs. So that was the first really important driver, my, my, my work journey. Um, I think the other things that uh, supported my journey was get, surrounding myself with others who were involved in the politics of disablement. So people who had written extensively, like Mike Oliver, uh, people who were doing uh, very brave and using imaginative courage to set the pace and the appetite for change, like Jane Campbell um, and others like Anne McFarlane and Vicky Waddington and, and Elspeth Morrison. So getting involved in those, the lives of others who were supporting the process of change really whetted my appetite to be helpful and useful. So, but let, let's tuck in that to some more. Tell, tell, remind me again, Kavita, that second part of your of your question. 
So what makes it a social and political issue? Um, how important is it to emphasise that disability is political? I think it's wholly important. You know, the social model of disability, which I'm sure we'll refer to again in our conversation, is something that really matters to me, you know, like a stick of rock. If you snapped me, the word social model of disability runs through me. And I, I know your audience will know that. And I think, you know, it's incredibly important still for us to emphasise the political nature of disability. It's a rights issue. It's not, you know, it's not now a philanthropic one. It's not one where individuals have to passively await the receipt, you know, of gifts, I suppose, you know, the, the dolly mixtures that, that might come out of successive governments. Um, and while we may have views of successive governments and how much investment is put into our lives, the reality is disability is now very much seen as a rights issue, as, a, as opposed to a philanthropic one. You know, that's not to say there's still a lot of work, I think, to do to support disabled people, people with disabilities, to learn the skills in order that we can lean into our lives with courage and to, I suppose, manage other people's stuff, as I call it, <laughs> yeah, often called microaggressions. So, you know, finding ways to navigate the often inadvertent uh, discrimination of others is, is really important. And I'd like to see more investment. We do see that in the business community. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's wholly proper still to keep beating that drum that disability is a political issue and and must be addressed uh, not just in terms of employment and access to goods and services but to governments that come and go. Could you maybe say just a little bit more about what the social model of disability is in contrast to the assumptions that people would make just in case members of the audience aren't familiar with that? Yes for sure. So the social model really is a framework for understanding how we as a society can make room to include disabled people and it it it, it broadly positions disability as as an a human experience whereby we face inelegant barriers around us. So that could be anything from uh inelegant uh policies and practices and procedures. It can be things like the transport system, but is not overly invested in creating um, safe uh, transport systems where disabled people can access easily. It includes still website. I'm, I'm sure we're going to come back to that uh, and artificial intelligence. So the social model is really about saying that we're not disabled by our individual medical definition, whether it's sight loss, whether it's mental ill health, whether it's our experience of neurodivergence, whether it's about arthritis or MS or, you know, a shotgun wound to the left leg. You know, the reality is we still have to find ways of navigating some aspects of these uh, human experiences. But our experience of discrimination is often about the inelegant barriers that are faced uh, and put in our way. Yeah. So my next question is, um, how is that complicated by intersectionality um, and its related issues? So could you reflect on some of the ways that gender and perhaps also race and sexuality intersect with disability politics, either in your own experience or in, in or in broader societal terms? So, I mean, are there experiences and challenges faced by disabled women and LGBTQ people uh, which are different or more complicated, whether that's to do with gender role expectations, abuses of power or other issues? Yeah, so it's a, it's a complex mix, but there are some really clear cases where the intersectionality piece um, plays a, a, a real part in people not being able to access what they need. I think there's a there's a few few areas that I'll mention. So the first is around uh, abuse. So it is the case um, that often. Uh, disabled women are significantly more uh, susceptible uh, to violent abuse. Uh, sometimes that's in relation to domestic abuse, but it's also in relation to uh, crime by unknown perpetrators. So the statistics, I don't have them to hand, but they are starkly 
uh, demonstrating that disabled women experience abuse and violent hate much more significantly than women who don't experience uh, disability. And of course, the question then becomes, so what needs to be done differently and better to support disabled women? So whether that's in practical ways in relation to uh, being able to use telephony services, you know, if you're deaf or hard of hearing and 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 you know you have a small perhaps NGO or an underfunded local authority who's unable to provide good access to the talking therapies perhaps that other non-disabled women might be able to more easily access although I have to say they're often hard to find in any case um, but yeah so that's that's a really big area I think and that's where we see it mostly played out that intersectionality piece I think other areas um, there's there's a big crossover between identity and disability as well as sexuality so you know a, a lot of um, straight disabled people will feel and experience some of the experiences of our LGBTQ plus colleagues uh, and citizens. And that's often about what's often called declaration and, and disclosure. And Kavita, you mentioned earlier, so my, my first book, Secrets and Big News, was called that, you know, it was a it was a naughty tongue in cheek expression, secrets and big news, because it was it was calling out that dynamic how hard it is often for people with disabilities to identify with the experience of disability. Um, you know, although I hang out with lots of political animals and we're less troubled or worried about using the notion of disability as part of our identity. He's kind of been there and done that and worn that T-shirt and don't feel squeamish. But for those people who may be new to that human experience or have just been diagnosed uh, and or have a diagnosis of a disability that has derailed them, you know, because it's not an experience that we will you know, choose to invite into our lives. It often comes in deeply uninvited ways. So to, to this point, so what does that mean? It means that we're often transitioning through that journey, not for everybody. Some people, of course, were born or acquire their experience of disability shortly after birth. There are those like me who experience disability in our in our teens. And yet the majority of individuals who experience disability uh, or neurodivergence or mental ill health will be those individuals who are um, experiencing that through the course of their working life. In fact, 86% of all disabled people in the UK are individuals who experience that through their course of their working life, which means they're having to transition through one part of their identity. I know we're complex human beings. None of us carry one identity. Sometimes being a mum is brought into sharp relief, sometimes experience grief, you know, sometimes experience uh, hatred or violent crime. So we experience different aspects of our identity and we spotlight on in different parts of our life. However, to my point, being able to find the tricks and the flicks and the techniques to identify with the experience of disability in a way that builds our positive brand and our resilient brand as human beings um, can, can be challenging. And it's a lifelong journey of understanding. And that is something that many of our LGBTQ plus colleagues and um, and folk feel too. But then there's also the the challenge of, of holding both aspects of those identities too, because we often talk about double disadvantage. I'm not a great fan of, of that language, because although those experiences do bring disadvantage, they also bring joy. So to overly emphasis, emphasize, I suppose, the challenging aspects can sometimes do a huge disservice about the fun you know, and the naughtiness and the sassiness and the vibrance of those aspects of our humanity. So so that's an interesting one. And I think lastly, around intersectionality, I suppose I feel moved to call out some of the challenges uh, that uh, disabled women face in terms of access to good health care. 
So again, you know, it is often the case that access to good health care is challenged by our experience of being a disabled woman or being uh, a black disabled person or being an LGBTQ plus disabled person. And again, that comes in many shapes and sizes. Um, but, you know, the statistics demonstrate that that that's hard. Anyway, I'm talking too much. Kavita, you just ask great questions. Not at all. Um, I was actually thinking I was really struck by how in your book like, there was um, an emphasis in some of the anecdotes you told about how you had to negotiate with your medical establishment. And I, I know that's something I can relate to in my own experience of chronic illness. So, um, yeah, it's very interesting. Um, there's also a really strong emphasis on, you know, what you what you just said about sort of how people have to narrate their own stories about their own understanding and experience. And there's a very notable emphasis on the power of storytelling and changing the narrative in Positively Purple. So why and how do you approach storytelling as a political tool? And in relation to that, to what extent is there a tension between a more critical versus more uplifting approach to disability advocacy? And of course, your book is called Positively Purple. So I know you have, um, yeah, very strong arguments about this. <laughs> yeah, great questions. So some thoughts. I mean, storytelling as a tool for change. Um, it's, it's not it's not unique to human difference. Um, it's used as a method of change, both in politics as well as as well as businesses, as well as sports, as well as everywhere you look, that the power of not just not just changing hearts and minds, but actually uh, driving wholesale systemic change is very well known, very well documented and very well taught. In, in different places. So the power of stories is just immense and has has the, the potential to to change history. You know, sometimes we do go backwards, but but nonetheless there are there are moments where where things happen. Um Kavita, I'm just noticed there is somebody knocking on my door. Oh the, the beauty of online working. Do you want me to just carry on or should I just stop? We we can't hear it, so just carry on. If that's okay. <laughs> Yes, of course. So um, so some thoughts around storytelling. I think in terms of the how a purple space, we um, place special emphasis in sharing stories um, and to build the skills and the tricks and the flicks and the techniques that you need in order to be able to share your story authentically with your colleagues. And it doesn't, it's never once and done. I think we are always learning as human beings the methods and the techniques that we can share better stories in order to land an important and a powerful message. Um, and when when I when I talk about that and I shared earlier, a lot of people are already transitioning, you know, from being a non-disabled person to to somebody who has acquired disability. And that can bring huge challenge individually about how to navigate that, how to express that. And it particularly can be really hard to learn how to share those stories without actually being derailed by aspects of our sadness and our, and our disappointment. You know, for all of it being a political experience, it's also an individual story that has to be navigated and often in the face of others around us who may too be unhappy or disappointed or sad about our lives. I talk extensively about the soft bigotry of low expectation. You know, it can have a profound effect about your feelings of self-worth. And sometimes you need to go away and privately make sense of that before you're able to navigate the stuff of others. But so to, to storytelling, it's a skill you build over time. It's, you know, we don't we don't always know how we might do that when we first acquire a disability um, and we perfect that. I think we take it with us to the grave. We're forever, you know, perfecting the art. But um, the necessity to do that, I think, is is very real. And, you know, we work with 4000 disability employee resource group leaders across 200 brands at Purple Space across 56 countries. And we see real systemic cultural change as people are able to build their skills in storytelling in a way that and we're quite deliberate about this, that helps people to think, to feel and to do things differently. 
So not to use cathartic stories, that's just about making sense of it in our head, but really to think deeply, what do we want other people to do differently as a consequence of our sharing our story? So that methodology, how do we want people to think, to feel and importantly, to do and to act in our presence? Um, so and, but, and then I suppose this, this tension, you, I love your question. So this tension between the critical versus the uplifting, and it is a tension. I think it's a very necessary and helpful tension, uh, having spent the best part or at least the early, more substantive part of my career uh, working in Westminster and Whitehall. You know, you can say you can take the girl out of Westminster and Whitehall, but you can't take the politics out of the girl. Um, and I, I, what do I mean by that? I mean, it's wholly essential for individuals and institutions and for purpose organisations to call out the deep and continued inequities that invade our lives. Uh, that said, sometimes the world changes and people change from different methods. And one of the things that we see extensively is how disability is often seen as a very negative human uh, aspect of, of human difference. So it's about welfare reform. It's about not, ac not accessing uh, the services that we need, et cetera. It's about hate crime and all of those things hold, uh, hold true. You know, I would never advocate that we don't call out those deep inequities but our story is also about naughtiness and sassiness and fun and joy etc so if you don't have that balance i don't think we drive human beings behavior adequately so for us you know positively purple uh the movement that we coalesce around international day of persons with disabilities it's about calling out the positive things that are happening in our name it's about calling out the fact that businesses are often getting it more right than more wrong. It's about calling out the fact that great, easy to use workplace adjustment policies and processes are are often available and accessible now. So, it, yeah, it's 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 a tension that exists. And I think it's it's important that I think advocates on either side or for us, you know, we we enjoy both. Um, but does that make sense, Kavita? Yes, it definitely does. Um, I think the sense of collective solidarity as well is such an important aspect of that fun and that kind of, you know, coming together to find joy in the politics of things and the activism against the status quo. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm really interested by, you know, what you just said about um, that businesses are getting more things right these days. So what do you see as the main achievements in disability rights and legislation over the course of your career and how have things changed? And are there still gaps between legislation and societal improvement in terms of dis disabled people's experiences and prospects? Um, and are there still contemporary issues that need addressing? I know that's a sweeping question, but how have you yeah. always answered to that? Great questions. I, I think for, for me, the, the, the main achievement as I look back you know, over my career uh, the main achievement was undoubtedly the Disability Discrimination Act of 1995. And of course, you know, all uh, equalities legislations were, were harmonised within the, the Equality Act. But it was a landmark piece of legislation that established disability as, as a rights issue uh, rather than a philanthropic one or one where we just kept our fingers crossed behind our back that we would be working for employers that would deliver the adjustments or the accommodations that we might need. So it was a landmark, you know, it was a compromise. Uh, all legislations are, are a compromise in, in one way or another. But nonetheless, it was a fantastic piece of legislation that uh, created a duty on employers to make workplace adjustments. And it also created a duty on service providers to make their services accessible and their products more accessible. Um, in terms of the things that I've enjoyed seeing, where I see real success, one is the routine ways in which employers 
are creating and reviewing their workplace adjustment and accommodation processes. So, you know, of course, the UN Convention has made it easier for countries around the world to uh, adopt and adhere and or to work to uh, uh, human rights um, issues when it comes to disability. But in terms of the practical manifestation, what I see is yes, there can be patchy. Yes, you can come across some really quite challenging workplace adjustment processes and policies with no real ownership or row accountability or some degree of squeamishness or, or nervousness. But that you really have to look hard now for, for hugely bad practice. And and it's 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 routine, it's established, and there's a res- recognition that the cost to provide a workplace adjustment is really quite negligible. You know, some of us, yes, of course, cost a wee bit more, but the average cost now of a workplace adjustment is something like between is different statistics and pieces of research, but anything between say three hundred pounds to to say seven hundred pounds is the average cost, which is is markedly favourable to say the cost of uh, maternity leave, for example, or paternity leave policies, etc. Um, so that's great, big tick. I think other great successes have been in uh, travel, uh, particularly rail, uh, and to a limited extent air travel as well. Um, and we've seen some real change over the last 20 years when it comes to that. You know, we all know, and I'm sure for those of you who are on X or Twitter, as it was called, or LinkedIn, we'll see the remarkable Sophie Morgan, who is doing a fantastic job to improve uh, air travel provision. So they, they've still got a long way to go, but certainly from what I see, we're seeing significant inroads. Um, to your question around the contemporary issues, I think there's, there's a couple that I would call out. I think the first is in, well, they, they're, they're both the same, really. They're different aspects of the same thing. So it's about uh, provision to accessible IT. So, you know, on the one hand, you know, the the, the horrors that we all went through in relation to the pandemic and, and COVID-19, they were very difficult and dark days for humanity. Um, I suppose the, the only plus that came out for people with disabilities, I suppose, was the ability to uh, encourage employers to work remotely, to allow employees to work remotely. We know that is changing. There's a lot of emphasis now on hybrid uh, and in some places a complete return to work. But nonetheless, it it changed fundamentally, I suppose, the ability for people with disabilities to ask for some remote uh, options in terms of working. However, I think and although we saw some great innovation and the existing tools like Teams, like Zoom, they just simply got better and better in terms of automatic captioning, etc. But we still see routinely a lot of websites not accessible to people with disabilities. Um, And, you know, again, it's not my area of expertise, although there are some great new pieces of legislation around websites, it's still the case that is, you know, often the case that people with disabilities, I think particularly in recruitment, they don't always act and are able to access some of the online tools to apply for jobs. And I think the the, the missile that's six inches below the waterline, the bit that we're really worried about is AI, artificial intelligence. So, you know, there's, there's some big question marks, I think, in their ability to recognize disabled people, for example. And, you know, if you're if you're recruiting using AI and, you know, you might experience neurodivergence where it's not in your nature to be able to look at somebody else in the eye, for example, and your preference is to look away, etc. And an AI picks up that you may be nervous or, you know, or or antisocial. You know, there's there's lots of stories about how AI is, is not adaptable for some of our behaviours, etc. So, yeah, so lots has been achieved. We do see a real sea change, I think, in the business community. I'm not suggesting there's not more to be done, but there there has been a real sea change in ability for people with disabilities to be more open, to access their workplace adjustments and to get on at work. But there is still lots, lots more to be done, for sure. It's wonderful. Um, 
In the book, you mentioned that you take a critical view of equality, diversity and inclusion initiatives. And I was really struck by this because it's also something that comes up in a lot of critical work in feminist and anti-racist scholarship and activism um, in writing about diversity and inclusion and how it can be um, a sort of surface level band-aid or a bureaucratic exercise rather than something that creates structural change. So could you share some of your own thoughts on EDI policies and unconscious bias trainings? Um, what should organisations be doing differently? Yeah, so some thoughts, some thoughts. Um, you know, I think it's about balance, I'd say. It's, it, it is about balance. Um, one of the things that, that I'm a huge fan of is in equity of spend and investment in relation to the kind of top of the shop, shop policies and practices and investment in line managers who you know want training in how to work with and accommodate the needs of disabled employees um, but also balancing that out with the need to invest in disabled talent so you know for example it's not uncommon that you see really great fantastic leadership programs for example to redress the power balance in terms of gender um, but you have to look really, really, really hard to find great quality leadership development training uh, for disabled talent, for example. So, um, so this is about investment. Um, I, I think, you know, we see, um, I, I think a few question marks, I think, when it comes to unconscious bias training. You know, and again, while I'm not an expert in this, I do pick up. I think extensively from the diversity, equity and inclusion professionals that we work so closely with is that sometimes they feel that the I suppose the 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 outcomes that come from unconscious bias training are not all that they're cracked up to be. You know, they don't always deliver what they say on the tin, <laughs> if that makes sense. And why they can be helpful and useful as a kind of sheep dip approach, helping people who are not au fait and are coming from a long way back, have had no experience of disability in their family, nor ever work with a disabled person. So sometimes there is a value in, in helping people to understand their bias. Uh, but sometimes they simply tell us that we live with unconscious bias, but there's no direct practical tools tricks and flicks for us to be able to overcome that because ultimately we need to know what do we need to do differently what are the practical applications about learning that we have an unconscious bias so i'm not sure if that's answered your question but i i think it's, it's about balance it's about making sure maybe people who don't have direct lived experience of disability at line manager level etc allies level have the opportunity to learn you know are able to be invested in so that they can tickle their curiosity and and their inquisitiveness that they can be encouraged to watch great YouTubes and learning and you know watch Crip Camp etc how do they become brilliant allies uh, and sometimes that's about a baseline of training and unconscious bias, but it has to be balanced by good investment into people with disabilities too. You know, it's that kind of 80%, 20% rule within businesses. So you've just got to make sure that that balance of investment is is real. Um, something I was really interested in when you were talking about the DEI um, or critiques of DEI in your book was um, this kind of tension or I guess this balance between building confidence on the one hand and then on the other hand unconscious bias training sort of not being enough it's kind of like a both and approach is that right? Yes absolutely absolutely you know we we've, we've taken I think quite an imaginative step at Purple Space to to produce uh, collateral and assets and publications and podcasts etc to help people build their inner confidence and to build their resilience, etc. Um, and it's not to suggest for one minute that, as I say, sometimes what we face is, you know, things that are just inequitable. This is about barriers. It's about policies or practices or, you know, the not the right equipment, you know, simple things, whether it's an ergonomic mouse or, a, I don't know, an easy grip pen, you know, 
all of these things. But the reality is, you know, we we do sometimes need to look inside ourselves and, and to consider what are the things that are in our gift to support other people to change. You know, very conscious, you know, that that book that Sheryl Sandberg wrote, Lean In, it's a very controversial book. Some people loved it. Some people hated it. And I, I suppose I chose simply to notice it, which is on the one hand, she didn't shy away from reminding us of the institutional barriers that, that impact on us as, as women, uh, the inequities that we, we still face, you know, the gender pay gap, et cetera. But equally, she, you know, kind of held up a mirror and it was a wee bit uncomfortable to sometimes be reminded that sometimes perhaps our behaviours uh, might collude with inequitable practices. So it's not easy. It's not an easy road to travel. But I think we have a duty as citizens, as humans, to notice the things that we can do as individuals to better frame our story and to lean in and help others to do things differently. And that relates back to the power of storytelling again, like how you just, well, you also said though in the book, this disclose is not the word you'd use, it's, it's about storytelling, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, your answers are absolutely fascinating and I think we could go on, we're making very good time, but I think maybe it would be good at this point just to see if the audience members have any questions or would like to chip in. Sorry, I don't know why it's not letting me turn my weapon on. Um, yeah, it's it's pronounced on yeah. Thanks. Sorry, Sorry. this has been it's okay. Um, yeah, it's been really fascinating. One of the things that I think it's been making me think about, particularly I guess, um, so we talked about intersectionality earlier, but also with the equality gap. Um, I was thinking about the areas in which we're kind of seeing attacks on on bodily autonomy so um with trans people and then i was thinking i guess like more across the pond but um with with access to abortion and actually i guess even you know in, in northern ireland still despite it being legalized that people don't actually have access to abortion and i was wondering if uh you see these kind of similar is it is it a similar trend with disabled people that um rights to bodily autonomy uh seem to be threatened in the current political moment i guess one example i think about perhaps is we were reading about some disabled people i think during the covid pandemic like having do not resuscitate orders written for them without their consent so i didn't know i was kind of curious as to what that looks like in the, in the disability uh, context thanks a oh, wonderful question. We could be here till midnight. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, let me let me start with that, because that is a great, great example um, where, as you say, during COVID, we saw uh, greater uh, use of the do not resuscitate notices. And, you know, sometimes this was when there might be an area of doubt when somebody may not have a living will, have not expressed their wishes and their desires, and therefore, I suppose, uh, very rushed, you know, to look on the, you know, to, to, to offer forgiveness, you know, really rushed NHS, a uh, completely stretched uh, healthcare system, had to, having to make the most inhumane of decisions about who lived and who died simply by access to uh, life support machines etc so i'm not excusing it for one minute but you yeah it was it was very real and it was incredibly alarming um and you know it followed through in other stories where for example people with disabilities who found it hard of course to access shops and having to stand in queues there wasn't enough masks etc so I think to your question, I think where, where I would leave it is there there is a greater debate about, I suppose, uh, I suppose um, about being bolder about aspects of our identity and being braver, I think partly because of our contemporaries from other movements are more vocal in the things that they need 
you know, and as you know, when you talk about trans community and the black community, you know, we see the Black Lives Matter movement through the pandemic. Um, you know, we saw a lot of uh, black employee resource group leaders, for example, quite rightly asking for more resources within their network as a consequence of this. And that emboldened, it's interesting, it had a positive effect on disability employee resource groups because they too felt emboldened to be able to ask for greater investment. So I'm not quite answering your question, but I think what, what we do notice is a more energised more articulate and more courageous community in identifying with the experience of disability, calling out our needs, whether that's about our bodies or our emotional needs or indeed our human rights needs, uh, for sure. But, you know, we still have a way to go, for sure. Yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, we have several questions from Anna in the chat. Uh, what do you believe are the most potent ways to help people, young people especially, to be aware that their human experiences are also political experiences? Oh, that's a beautiful question. Do you know, I talk in the book about some of the joy I take from seeing um, young people uh, feel the the backdrop of legislation in their lives what i mean by that you know obviously social media has a huge role you know i obviously in terms of my age i grew up in an area where there was no social media there was no internet and and now youngsters uh and those who experience disability either at birth or through their teenage years they have the backdrop of rights legislation in a way that myself and my contemporaries did not now, many of us don't enjoy using the blunt instrument of, of the law. We, we know that. Uh, but nonetheless, when you grow up with that as a backdrop, I think that kind of emboldens you some more. So um, I, I, I just hope that there is a it continues to be what I would say a tipping point, because if you if 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 you are educated alongside con disabled contemporaries you know if you are able to befriend you know some of your 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 fellow workers your contemporaries at work etc you know you're more likely to be able to make bolder asks at, at, at work and um you know the the youngsters now of today I tell the story for example of some of the social media activates active activists in this space there's a wonderful model for example who works for Kurt Geiger and I think I've pronounced that I, I don't have a huge amount of money to be able to spend with Kurt Geiger but I talk about how this wonderful model she stares provocatively at the camera and she's armed with beauty and youth and one leg she's an amputee and she does dare us to spend money and and that level of courageous spirit to be who you are to accept and you know and 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 to 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 assimilate a human experience that that many people find hard i think is wonderful so i think it's going to come and come i think you know we i feel be excited i think by how the next generations will continue to build a rights based approach to disability inclusion um following on from that I'll just pick out another question from Anna. Yeah. What do you believe is the greatest barrier to disability activism right now? Oh, that's a good question. What is the greatest barrier? Ooh. Oh, my goodness. Where do I start? Lots of things pop into my head. The greatest barrier to disability inclusion. I think possibly. We're becoming very shouty as citizens. You know, the, it's it's we, we live in an era where you can where you can you can share what's going through your mind immediately and at the point of thought whether that's using x formerly known as twitter whether it's linkedin whether it's instagram you know whether it's tiktok at the point of thought we can share and you know in philosophical terms i suppose you know the wonderful great question that we are invited to consider when taking a philosophical approach to change is, you know, what would the wise person say? What would the wise person say? And I think one of the challenges 
to activism around disability to address the continued fundamental inequalities that do exist, even though life has gotten better. And I'm of an age that I can compare and contrast. I think it's we we live in a very shouty world. And sometimes that's about the very necessary process of making sense of identity and connecting with others and learning you know learning what we like what we don't like in terms of our approach to get things done but the downside of that is what is often called cancel culture etc so i think it might stop some very clever capable competent individuals for leaning in to the process of driving change perhaps perhaps you know plus underinvestment i think the other challenge is huge underinvestment you know that's not that's not a political um statement with a with a capital p it's it's simply the way it is uh and it's like where do you start <laughs> you know where do you start when economies are twe- squeezed and coming out of pandemic uh there are still challenges in terms of brexit you know there are challenges in terms of 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 the war in ukraine so we we live in a challenged humanity so it almost feels that maybe disability is perceived as being a bit too domestic um anyway i'm talking i'm thinking <laughs> it's a great question but there's, there's loads of food for thought here um so while the audience are thinking of more questions i mean i can follow up on that the issue of like the shoutiness on social media is interesting and i wonder how much of that comes from like the emotional labour involved in disability activism or you know activism in general when you're marginalised. Um, what's your advice for people in managing the emotional labour it takes to negotiate with and respond to the assumptions of others? That's something that came out really strongly in your book that this constant having to face this constant tension of having to face the assumptions of others and you know that's a significant barrier as well. I mean how did you manage those moments that you found particularly stressful and what do you do now when you encounter those moments? Yeah. Yes, well spotted, Kavita. So, you know, I um, and I like the way you described it, the emotional labour. I enjoy your expression. I don't enjoy the process, but I enjoy how you have phrased that. So one of the stories I share in the book is um, is about the fact we have to beware the purple rage. I call it the velvet rage. There's a wonderful writer who talks about the velvet rage in terms of navigating life as somebody from the LGBTQ plus community and having to navigate other people's stuff. And, and, and it's the same often for people with disabilities who have to weather constantly the soft bigotry of low expectation. And that can come in soft and insidious ways. Uh, it can come from those who love us the most, dare I say it. And that that can be really hard to manage. So the emotional cost, the emotional labour to navigate this stuff is is very, very, very real. It's very real. And in terms of how, what I often share and invite others to do is first to notice it. Because, you know, it's all very well to believe and to understand, indeed, to know that the social model of disability has made it very hard for people with disabilities to navigate you know it's it's other it's it's the barriers that we face rather than our individual but the reality is we still at a very human level have to on a daily basis find ways of building our tools our techniques and our tricks and our flicks to navigate other people's stuff so what do i mean by that you know i i walk inelegantly I had hips replaced and knees replaced and we're going around again. So at the moment, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm still walking, though that is likely to change. And so if I'm in London and I take a taxi or and you know, I get the same phrase, what happened to you, love? <laughs> I can do one of two things. I can snap at that person because I've heard it a thousand times or I can choose to breathe and I can I can give the naughty response. I could I could choose to lie. I could say, oh, I was playing football last night because it cheers me up. <laughs> it's not to say that I played football last night, but it's you've got to find the tools that will help you endure the fact that human beings are curious. And that's not a bad thing. It's a human thing. It may not 
it may create huge emotional labour on my part, but it doesn't make that taxi driver a really, really, really bad person. You know, it makes it a taxi driver who's trying to strike up a conversation with me. So I, I, it's to, 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 to your question, it's about slowing down. It's about thinking about these things. It's about managing anger sometimes and finding ways that you can process. It's about reading for me. It's about networking with my contemporaries. It's about sharing the stories and finding the irony and the funny and the humorous within that. Uh, because if I were to allow those types of statements to sit inside me, it would have had a massive and deleterious impact on my ability, not just to navigate work, but to be a human being that gets some joy out of life. So, yeah, I hope that makes a little sense. Definitely. Uh, do we have more audience questions? Uh, if not, there was one more in the chat from Anna that I'll just pick out because I'm sure you can speak to this. There was a lot, there was a lot in your book that speaks to this question. So um, what do you believe are the most potent ways to bring out um, bring about widespread celebration of disabled people and their experiences and identities. And I'm sure you've got a lot to say in response to that. Yeah, lovely question. So, yes, well, one of the things uh, that I did some years ago, so 2017 uh, in, in July, I was noticing uh, our, our colleagues in the business sector, LGBTQ plus business sector, who were so skillfully using the rainbow flag to build community and unity across ERGs. It was just wonderful. And, you know, seeing the rainbow flag adorn, you know, Metropolitan Police and, you know, the cathedral in 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 um, in York. And, you know, it was just wonderful. It's just wonderful. And the question on my mind, given that the colour purple was increasingly becoming synonymous with the disability ERG movement, was was it time now to to bring three things together. One was International Day of Persons with Disabilities, uh, two, the colour purple, and three, the joy of community and unity. And so I put out a stray tweet into the world, and of course it became a movement. It was it was known as Purple Light Up, and we most recently changed its name to Positively Purple, uh, not to sell more copies of the book, she said quickly, <laughs> but to recognise that it's not about light bulbs. It never was about light bulbs. It was a movement that was designed to bring together the joy and the humanity of having a disability and to connect employee resource group leaders around the world who want to connect, want to reach each other, want to share best practice and to change the world for the better. So, so that's that's one of the, the the ways in which we build joy and celebration and positivity and build what is really a can-do community of change agents within the business community. It's brilliant, Kate. I mean, we could talk all night, I think, all day and possibly into the night. I mean, if there's so much learning and everything that you're saying, but I think here it might be good to um, thank you and then stop the recording and then so we'll see if the discussion continues a little bit.